buenos dias. How is everybody doing? Let's all stand this morning. Let's worship. Let's raise a hallelujah. Let's go into the Lord um, with prayer. Father God, we just thank you for allowing us to enter your courts, Father God. Thank you, Father, for having open arms, Father, for us. We just love you and glorify you, Father God. We just worship you this morning. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Let's raise a hallelujah this morning. much for Roro, 16 years old. Come on. Awesome. That's awesome. I love that. I, I don't think I could sing at 34 years old, so very good. 
Very good. Okay, so today, if you'd like to join us, we are heading out to Church Without Walls, going to serve the uh, homeless today. 2.30, we'll be out there at 737 Clear Eye Road. You're welcome to join us to serve, and you're also welcome to come back and do the dishes with us as well. Anybody? Anybody can help. All right. Also, the youth group is going to be heading out and joining us for that as well. So we're excited about that. We've got a busy uh, second half of the month coming up. We've got paint class. We're going to be painting uh, pumpkins on the uh, 20th uh, here in the Grace Hall. And then the men of Grace are going to be meeting on the 23rd. Uh, at Bill's house, so join us for that. The address is there, uh, 8302 Dawson Court at 530. And then the women are going to have their last meeting of the year before their Christmas party, October 27th at 630 at Michelle's house for the Grace Sisterhood. And then finally, we also have Trunk or Treat, which is we're uh, inviting all of you to bring your cars over on Halloween decorate them, bring some candy. We've got candy donations being made over there on the um, in the far left corner there. Uh, I did notice that someone uh, broke into the candy. If you need candy, folks, we'll get you some, okay? <laughs> All right, and one other announcement that uh, we're, I'm not, uh, it's not on the slide, it's not scheduled to be announced, but I'm just so excited I can't, I can't contain it because, uh, you know, 10 years ago when we came to this church, when I started this church, we did not have a kid's place at Grace. We did not have a school and we set out with a vision to have the best school in Corpus for six weeks old all the way to five years old. And we worked very hard, and you've been part of that, uh, to have a great school. And last year, we won the runner-up for the best of the best. And, you know, people get excited about that, but uh, runner-up, come on, come on. So uh, we, we've worked very hard to have a great, great school. And this year, we just recently awarded the 2022 uh, Corpus Christi best of the best for our school. Yeah. So, yeah. Very excited. That's a very big deal. So, and we, uh, we've grown that school. We do almost no advertising other than word of mouth, which is the best way. So, by the way, if you like the church, it's word of mouth is still the best way. Churches grow like restaurants. You invite people. You say, hey, have you checked out Grace? How'd it go? There's this guy. He talks a real long time, but you'll love it. Really, it's great. All right, so let's stand up and pass the peace of Jesus Christ and uh, welcome everyone. Welcome online folks. Glad to have you. Peace. Peace out, Boy Scout. See you, lamb chop. <laughs> hey. We are going to take up an offering now as we give back to God. Let us pray. God of grace, we give thanks for this time to worship you. We give thanks for this time to give back to your kingdom. We ask you bless and multiply these gifts to be used to further the message of Jesus Christ and the good news and to welcome this community to God's love. We pray in his name, amen. Amen. Let's worship as we pick up this offering. Last week we sang a new song called The Great I Am. Let's, let's sing it again. Let's engrave it in our hearts, amen. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and he stands with
cervezas. Father, holding you close to us, Father God, because you are the great I am. You are the King of Kings. You are the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning of the end. You are God, Father God. May we never forget that, Father God, that you go before us. We just praise you. In the darkness we will wait Without hope and without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From the throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt You know it church, praise the Father Don't come and to reconcile. 
reconcile the lost To redeem the whole creation You did not despise the cross For even in your suffering You saw to the other side Knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died fantastic band. Amen? You did a great job. All right. So I don't know, have you all ever been tempted to make the wrong choice? Anybody here been tempted? <laughs> and you know, sometimes the temptations are really, really stupid and simple and easy. Last week I was walking my dog, Lexi, sexy Lexi, my little miniature schnauzer. And uh, on the walk, uh, she did what dogs do. And I always have the little blue bag with me, you know, the little blue bag so the HOA doesn't get mad at me or anything. And uh, I'm getting ready to clean it up, getting ready. And then I thought to myself, wait a minute. It's 6.30 in the morning. It's completely dark. Who's going to see? Who's going to care? These people don't go to my church. I probably won't get in trouble. I have other thoughts that go along with it, right? And the thoughts are usually like this, you know, like, you don't have to live by the rules that everybody else lives in. I mean, what's an HOA anyway? I mean, you can be special. You can be entitled. Now, where do those thoughts come from? From me and my brain. I have much deeper, darker thoughts as well, much deeper, darker temptations. Do you want to hear them? Wrong Sunday, I'm not doing it, nope, nope. <laughs> Wrong Sunday, too bad. Sometimes when it comes to silly temptations and stuff like this, Renee will say to me, John, you can only be young once, but you have proved that you can be immature forever. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. So. so we're talking about decisions and who you are. So percentage-wise, percentage-wise, how many of you would say, just show of hands, how many would say, I like about 84.5% of what I do and who I am. Yeah, I'm pretty good about that. Yeah, yeah okay, we've got a lot of good self-esteem in here. How much, how much do you want to change? Okay, turn to your neighbor right now and say, how much percentage-wise do you think I need to change? Go ahead and do that real quick. Ask them. 
How many of you heard 100% complete makeover? Anybody? <laughs> We've got a couple of hands back here. Yes, yes. So, so we're in this series on wisdom. We're in uh, week three now on wisdom and the power of making choices. And we're looking at how the choices that we make actually make us and that you are the sum of your choices, that who you are today is a result of who you chose to be yesterday and who you'll be tomorrow is what you choose today. And here's the good news about this series and really one of the main points that I really want to say today. So are you, are you awake? Say amen. amen. All right. You are only one decision away from totally changing your life. Only one. Think about this, the thief on the cross, the one who believed in Jesus as watching Jesus die, he said, remember me when you go into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me. And he made one decision and it totally changed his life for eternity. The other thief did not make that decision. So you're only one decision away from, from totally changing your life. Now, what's also true though is the law of inertia. Y'all are familiar with the law of inertia. An object tends to remain at rest until acted upon by an outside force. Likewise, if an object's in movement and going in a certain direction, it tends to keep going in that direction until acted upon by an outside force. Are you with me? So, if you like the direction of your life, if you like the way you're moving, if you like the way you're going, then maybe you don't need to make a decision. But if you don't like that, maybe you do need to make a decision. So I remember growing up, my dad used to always ask me this question. I don't know why, but he just always asked me, does anyone else have a dad that asked you this question? Besides, what do you want to do with your life? <laughs> Where are you going to be five years from now? Did anyone else have a dad that asked that question? What do you want to be five years from now? Just, there's like three of us. Okay, apparently it was not a prominent question. All right, so. So what do you want to be five years from now? When I asked the nine o'clock service this, which is it's primarily older people than you, they all said, we want to be alive. <laughs> Anyone want to be alive five years from now? All right, very good. That's a good sign. So you're only one decision away from changing your life if you need to change your life, if you don't like the direction you're moving. In other words, whatever you think about the most, that will be your life. You need to think about what you think about. You're always becoming whatever you're thinking about. Your life always moves in the direction. Whatever you think about will flow and expand. So do you like the way your life is moving or do you need to make a change? Now here's what research shows when you talk about who you're gonna be five years from now, who you're gonna be 10 years from now. Here's what research shows, and this can be good news or bad news depending on where you're at. Future you is simply an exaggerated version of you right now. How many of you are excited about that? How many of you are depressed by that? <laughs> you know, sometimes we think rather romantically, like, who am I going to be? It's this mysterious thing, mysterious thing, like, who am I going to be when I grow up? You're going to be exactly like you are right now, just exaggerated. Okay? Like, just look at yourself, like, with more miles on the odometer, okay? Okay? Really, that's the way to look at it. What do I mean? What do I mean by that? And for instance, if you are kind today, you're going to be even kinder five years from now because those things deepen, those things mature. If you're generous today, you'll be even more generous five years from now because those things get into you, they get into your ways, and they become settled. If today you are cruel, you will be even crueler five years from now. Okay, you'll be harsher still. Those things deepen down as they get into the cracks of who you are and they harden and they form and they make your character. If you're disciplined today, you're more likely to be disciplined five years from now. What I'm trying to get you to see, and this is just, this is really important like when it deals with the selection of your spouse, the selection of who you want to spend the rest of your life with. I just did a wedding last night on the beach Beautiful wedding, beautiful night. They had a little flower arrangement in the shape of a heart. They were very young. And uh, the guy, I said, hey, why do you like your wife? And he's like, man, wait till you see her. Wait till you see her. So beautiful. And you know what? He was right. She was great looking. And I said, yeah, but what about the interior? And he's like, wait till you see her. 
doesn't matter, doesn't matter. And I said, hey, be careful. Be careful, because when all you see is the flower and the grass, guess what happens to flower and grass? It dies. Guess what? Right now, today, is the youngest you're going to look. Tomorrow, you will look worse. <laughs> Thanks for coming to church, Pastor. And I said to him, look, the things that get better with time right, are the invisible attributes that are etched on the inside of the soul. So make sure you know your partner's soul and character because those things that they are right now, they will be more exaggerated in the future. So this is not a sermon on swiping right. This is a sermon on making decisions. So research shows this. Time doesn't change who you are. Time actually reveals who you are and makes you more of who you are. Time isn't going to change you. Oh, I'm going to be different in the future. No, you're going to be exactly like you are making choices today, just more set in your ways. So some of you are like, okay, pastor, you gave us some research. Now, how about giving us some biblical backup for this? I'm going to give it to you. Are you excited about that? Say yes. yes. Yeah, I like that. That was good. All right. That was good. Proverbs. Read the book of Proverbs. Man, I read Proverbs every day. I love Proverbs. 4,000 years old, still as true as it ever was. Proverbs eleven twenty seven, he or she who earnestly seeks good favor or seeks good will find favor, but trouble will come to the one who seeks evil. If you, this is what the proverb is saying. If you look for good, if you are seeking good, if you look for good in people, if you look good for situations and you, you look for the good in the situation and you live with faith-filled optimism, guess what you'll find in life? Favor, blessings, you'll find it. But if you're seeking trouble, if you're seeking evil, if you're the first person that finds a problem, in the situation, like you're, the, you're that person, right? If you're the first to see the faults in everybody else, guess what you'll find? Evil. Oh, and how would we know that's true about you? How would we know that, that you are that person? Well, we could just read your text. We could just look at your emails. We could just think about your little quick quips and your quick retorts and the things you snicker at. And if you're looking for evil, you're going to find trouble. In other words, think about this way. Are you more vulture or are you more hummingbird? Vultures spend their whole day looking for dead stuff. Hummingbirds look for flowers. Which one are you? Apparently you're undecided. <laughs> Can I be a hybrid? The Bible says it this way. You talk about the rolling stones. I love this verse. Whoever digs a pit, right? You dig a pit for somebody. Oh, I hope they fall. Will fall into it. And he who rolls a stone will find it rolling back upon him. Proverbs 26, 27. In other words, if there's a critical nature about you, if there's a wounded spirit, if you're rushing around to cast judgment on people, if you're rushing around to throw stones, right? Christians should be the last people to be in the stone throwing business when we follow a guy who said, I don't throw any stones. Okay? If you have that kind of critical spirit, it will boomerang back upon you. Dig a pit of condemnation for someone else, you fall into it. You are what you eat. You become what you watch. You reap what you sow. This is what Jesus is teaching. So future you, not that mysterious. It's current you, exaggerated. This means, though, good news, if you don't like what you're getting, you can change what you're doing because you're just one decision away from changing your life. So let me tell you about a girl that maybe you don't know, but she's going to be president one day, and I'm going to vote for her. Her name is Marie Copenay. Marie Copenay, why do I think she's going to be president one day? Because of what she did five years ago. Five years ago, more than five years ago, in 2016, do you remember in 2016 in our country when everyone became aware of the problems with the water supply in Flint, Michigan? Everyone remember that? Yes, amen? Right? And it led to residents, to, it wasn't just like when, like here when we have like the E. coli, you know, water boil stuff. It wasn't like that. People were sick and dying. Okay, there was poison in their water. But amazingly, at eight years old, how did this story break? How did the federal government get involved? 
because of an eight-year-old. I'm not kidding. Marie Copenay wrote a letter to President Obama in 2016. Now, usually when you write a letter to the president, you just get a form letter back. President Obama actually wrote her a letter back. She got his attention. It's amazing. And he went to visit Flint, Michigan. And he actually named her Little Miss Flint. And we have a picture of her, Little Miss Flint. I love this, okay? I'm not trying to be political here. I love this. That visit had resulted in $100 million of federal government aid to the city of Flint, Michigan. And it didn't stop there. She actually went on to fundraise over $640,000 for Flint, and she actually handed out more than a million bottles, a million. She handed out herself a bottle of water to people, and then she developed working with a company, Water Filters. She's eight. Most of you haven't done that at 28. So she said her next goal, they asked her, what's your next goal? She said, run for president in 2044. She got my vote. I'm voting for her. Anyone else? Because what's true of her five years ago is going to be even more true five years from now. So do you like the direction of your life? Do you like the exaggerated version of who you are? If you don't like what you've been getting in your life, maybe you need to change what you're doing. Okay? You need to make some different decisions. You need to value some different things. You need to watch out what ways you're letting into your life. We all let certain ways into our life because the ways you let into your life become the ways that get set in your life. Your habits, your thought life. Man, your thought life. If I could counsel people every day, every day I counsel people once, watch what you think about. The choices that you let in become the ways that you get set in. Hello? Somebody say Amen. All right. A friend of mine, a mentor of mine, puts it this way. The evening of life, the evening of life is determined by the morning of it. If you're still living in the morning of life, in other words, if you're young, you can make decisions right now that will change the evening of your life when you're old. If you're in the evening of life, you're old, you can make decisions before the dawn breaks out. It's never too late. So let's also understand this. Are you all still awake? Say amen. Amen. Let's also understand when it comes to deciding what to do with our life, there's an important axiom always at work. And here it is. Ongoing consistency is much more important than short-term intensity. Ongoing consistency every time trumps short-term flared-up intensity. Have you ever, just, just hypothetically, have you ever gone, how many of you have ever gone three months without working out? Just raise your hand if you've ever gone three months. Bunch of slackers, holy heck. All right, so three months go by, and you go to the doctor, and, you know, you're like, he's like, hey, you're fat. I mean, they don't say it that way, but they just they have this BMI thing. They go, you're, you're basically, you're fat. I mean, that's basically. So then you go home, and you're like, that's it, I'm working out. And you work out, and you are super, super intense, and you do a two and a half hour workout, and you're just dripping in sweat. And then you get on the scale, and you're like, you're still 40 pounds fat. And you're like, what? Or have you ever done this? Like, man, I'm going to eat healthy this week. So Monday, you have like carrots for breakfast, lunch is raisins and oatmeal, and then dinner is just a salad, no dressing. You are a rabbit all day long. And then the next day you get on the scale, still 40 pounds way overweight. In fact, you've gained a pound. What the heck? Anybody? All right. I ate a salad for breakfast today. Why am I not skinnier? Consistency. But here's what I hear. When I counsel people, this is what I hear. I ain't got time for consistency, pastor. I want to diet one day a month and look fantastic. I want to work out one time a year and look great. I want to go from the before picture to the after picture overnight. I want a microwave change. I read a couple Bible verses. Pastor, why am I not a a man of God immediately? Why am I not a spiritual giant? It's so frustrating. And this is what I hear. I don't hear it exactly like this, but this is what I hear. Is there like a pill I can take? Is there some hot water we can pour over it? Is there something on Amazon I can order? Why can't I just be a great husband, pastor? 
Is there like a marriage conference I can go to that'll make me into a great husband pastor? No, you got to do the dishes and quit being a jerk. Oh, I don't like that, pastor. I tried it one time and you don't understand. You're not married to my wife. No, thank God I'm not. You can't jump from the before picture to the after picture without going through consistent, everyday, long-term decision-making of who you want to be. I'll give you an example because some of y'all are looking at me weird, like every Sunday. (laughs) There was a study done in Australia on the effects of sunscreen and aging. Now, understand this. My son, Jacob, he put sunscreen on every day, and I was like, you're kind of weird. Why? He came out from the bathroom one day and just like, it would look like he was wearing a mask. You know, I'm like, what's going on? Sunscreen, dad, every day you need to start wearing it. I'm like, ah, I don't know. So my son sends me this study. I was like, pretty good study. They took 900 people. The average age was 39. Split them up into two groups. One group was told, wear high powered sunscreen, wait for it whenever it's sunny. Okay. If you're going to the beach, if you're going to be out in the sun, man, throw some sunscreen on. And, and like, that's probably the strategy most of us have. SPF 50, if it's sunny, I got to put it on, right? Nuclear proof, right? Okay. The other group, they were told, the other group was told, you wear SPF 15 every day. Every day? Are you kidding me? Every day. I want you to wear it every day. But I live in Alaska. Wear it every day. But I live in an igloo. Wear it every day. But all I do is work in a dark room and dark light. And I, don't, I drive home at night, wear it every day. Sunscreen, SPF, 15. Not even that high powered. Almost five years went by. Four years, four and a half years. Convenient. And they studied the before and after pictures of what people look like. And the group was told that was told to put higher SPF only when it's sunny. When comparing the pictures, they themselves, everyone who looked at it, the scientists who looked at it, they could not deny that they had aged, that they had looked older, that they looked older than they did five years ago. There was aging. There's a blemish there and a blemish here and a blemish there that was not there five years ago. Are you with me? This person looks older. Are you with me? Would you believe the group that only put on SPF 15 every single day had no visible signs of aging, no blemishes, and in five years their pictures look virtually identical? Turns out slow, ongoing consistency, steady, beats flared up intensity. Oh, it's sunny. You got to put it on real quick intensity. So what's true of your skin is also true of your soul. You're supposed to go, oh, pastor, that's brilliant. Okay, all right. What's true of your skin is also true of your soul, okay? I, I, I don't know. I, I grew up like I was the guy in the family, like the family pictures that would make a face right when, you know, your parents were paying for the family photo and you'd go, who? <laughs> Did y'all ever make faces like a picture and your mom would like, would you quit making that face? And my mom would always do this. Like I'd make a face, who? And she'd go, your face is going to get stuck like that. It's going to be frozen forever. That'd be awkward to preach like this the whole time. (laughs) Turns out there's actually science behind what my mom was saying. You can grow smile lines or wrinkle lines depending on what your constant normal is. In other words, the life you get stuck with is the life that you make it. So make it a good one. And you're only one decision away from making a totally different life. But chances are you're going to keep moving in the direction you're moving until you make that decision. So let me jump into a very important decision with the rest of our time here that we all make. Everyone in this room makes every day. Every day of our lives, there's one very important decision we all make, and that is this. How do we use our time? How do we use our time? We even have language around it. How do you spend your time? Time, to me, is the real currency of our day. People People get all excited about money. I could always make more money. I can do more weddings. I can do more funerals as long as I'm still alive. I can make more money. But time, I can't make more of it. Time is the real currency. And how many of you have ever said, I wish there was more time to do something that was really important to me? How many of you have ever said that? Okay, virtually everyone in the room that's being honest, okay? I wish I had more time to rest. 
I wish I had more time to read. I wish I had more time to spend with my kids. I wish I had more time to date my spouse. I wish I had more time to do garden or to go fishing or to go surfing or just to spend time in church listening to Pastor John go on and on and on. I can have my fantasies, okay? But if you're like most people, what do you say? Oh, my gosh, I got dishes to, to do. I got, I got to you know, mow the yard. I got chores to complete. I got a work project. I got bills to pay. I got to go to work. I've got kids to raise. And I've got to get my Instagram caption just right after 500 selfies with the right filter on. And I don't know if you've noticed this or not. Whenever I ask people how you're doing, whenever you ask people how are you doing, the most common response, the most common, everybody says it. I'm so tired of hearing it. Everybody says it. You know what they say. Hey, how you doing, man? Let's say it all together. Let's say the response that everybody says when you say how you're doing. Everybody says, I'm so busy. Apparently, you're not with me. <laughs> what do people say when you say that? I'm done. <laughs> Forget it. You know, everybody says, I'm so busy. I'm so busy. I never have anybody say, man, I'm so relaxed. I'm just chilling out. Life is easy. I had so much quality time with my kids. I don't have much going on. I think if the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. And he'll make you busy doing things that don't really matter. How are you doing? I'm busy. That's why I've been training myself the last three months. I've been training myself really hard to, to never say, I wish I had more time for, or to never say, I don't have enough time for this. The reason I'm working at this is because I actually always have time for what I choose to have time for. I do. We all have time for what we choose to have time for. People online are spending their time right now watching people in this chair today, you've chosen this time. Anytime I wish I'm saying I wish I had more time, I'm actually choosing something over something else. Because therefore, I'll never say I don't have time for something because I choose what I have time for. We all have time. We spend that time. It's currency. So I want to talk about a very important distinction when you think about spending your time and that is, I want to choose the important over the urgent. With God's help, he'll empower me to choose that which is important over the urgent. Well, wait a minute, Pastor. I thought urgent things were always important. And I want to bring up a little distinction. Are you still with me? Say amen. amen. All right, very important distinction. Because urgent things are not always important things. There's a difference. I'll give you a few examples. For example, if you're a business owner and you've got an upset, angry customer, dealing with that customer is urgent, right? Amen? Say right, yes. But creating customers and systems where customers interact, creating those systems that keep the customers from getting upset, that's actually important. Two different things, one urgent, one important. If your car engine needs repair because you didn't ever change the oil on it, right? I got 20,000 miles, I haven't changed the oil, and your car engine breaks down, getting your car engine repaired is urgent, but changing your oil is important. Another example, if you're really sick because you didn't take care of yourself, you didn't sleep, you're overwhelmed, you're doing too much, going to the doctor when you're, when you're sick is urgent. That's why they call them urgent care clinics, right? But taking care of your body so you don't get sick is actually important. I only want to choose the important over the urgent. And it's easy to get swept up in this, right, to fight fire after fire. But what if instead of fighting fire after fire, we figure out how to prevent fires happening in the first place? Fires are urgent. Preventing fires are important. Do you understand the distinction? Yes, somebody say amen. If you choose what is important, you won't deal with as many things that are urgent. Think about that. If you choose what is important, you won't deal with as many things that are urgent. But the opposite is never true. 
If you're only choosing that which is urgent, you're not going to be faced with more things that are important. So therefore, we're going to choose the important over the urgent. So you can actually see this biblically, because I know you're like, okay, this is great psychology, but is this in the Bible? Absolutely. You can look in New Testament, Luke chapter 10. It's a story of two sisters. They both have names that start with an M. Maybe you know their names. They are Mary and Martha. Sounds like a sitcom, right? Mary and Martha. We're going to look at Martha, and Martha is just like Martha Stewart, right? She's overwhelmed by the urgent, so much so that she misses what's important. We'll pick up the story in Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Here's how Luke described the story. He said, Jesus and his disciples were on their way. And he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. Now we know, we know Jesus often, often went to Mary and Martha's home. And Lazarus, they were all good friends. And Jesus brought his disciples. They went there for for recreation and to rest and and to eat good food. And, of course, Martha opened up her home, and she had a sister called Mary. And we're going to see Mary chooses what's important. Here's what the Scripture says. Mary sat at the Lord's feet, at Jesus' feet, okay? And that is actually a biblical way of saying she's learning from him. When you hear, when you see the phrase sitting at someone's feet, that's saying you're learning from them, okay? You're, you're learning from them. You're being coached. Uh, listening to what was said, Mary chose what was important, Martha did what many of us would do. She surrendered to the urgent. Now, Martha gets all wigged out because she wants everything to be just right because Jesus is in her house. Now, before we throw her under the bus, let's just be honest. How many of you, if you found out today at like, let's say one o'clock today at one o'clock, someone very important that you care about is coming to your house? For lunch, how many of you would go into complete frenzy mode right after church? Come on, be honest, right? We all do it, right? Someone's coming over. This is how it works in my house. Oh my gosh, what? This is usually the way it works. Renee's like, you didn't tell me they're coming over. Oh yeah, I forgot. When are they gonna be here? In a half hour. Oh my gosh. You run around, you're grabbing stuff, you're throwing it in closets, throwing it under the bed. Anybody else? Okay, right? And then, what are you, she, well, this is Renee. Get the expensive candle out. You know the expensive one, the one we only light when people come over. Get that one out. Get that candle out, the one that smells good. We like that, right, right? Get the potpourri. And then, she, and then what do I do? Put on some worship music. Put on some worship music. <laughs> I'm a pastor. Put on the worship music. Right? Panic, panic. It's got to be good. This is just for a regular person. Now, imagine if Jesus is coming over. The 45 throw pillows that we have. I am still trying to figure out why my wife has 45 throw pillows that we're not allowed to touch or use. One day I came home, I'm leaning against the throw pillow. It was like the end of the world. What are you doing? That's a look pillow, not a, not a sit pillow. I didn't even know there was a difference. Every guy in the nine o'clock came up to me after this. They're like, we've been wondering the same thing about the throw pillows. What is the deal? <laughs> Ladies, we need some help with this. Anyway, 45 throw pillows just right. The potpourri's got to match the shower curtain. Come on. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the great I am is coming to your house. Martha freaks out and she misses what's really important. Verse 40. Here's what it says. Martha was distracted by all the preparations that were having to be made. I don't know about you. I get more and more distracted all the time. This last Friday, I came up for the office real quick. It's my day off. I was was just trying to do something real quick, do some stuff on the computer real quick. And then I'm trying to leave, and I can't find my keys. Three minutes. Where's my keys? Where's my keys? Where's my keys? My keys were in my mouth. (laughs) The other day, I'm like, I'm like, I'm, I'm ready to go for a walk. I'm ready to do my three miles. And I'm like, I'm like waking up Renee because she was off this last week. Like, hey. Have you seen my earbuds? Have you seen my earbuds? She's like, they're in your ear, idiot. They're right here. I don't know why I'm telling you this. It's probably cheaper than therapy. That may be it. I don't know. Martha's distracted by all the preparations. I love this phrase. She, all the things she has to get done. She came to Jesus, and what does she do? She tattletales, grown woman. Tattletales. 
This is what she did. Lord, don't you care? My sister's left me to do all the work, to do all the kitchen, do all the cooking, and all the cleaning. Tell her to help me out. Martha's wigging out, throwing a fit. Jesus, tell her to help me out. You ever done that with your, when you're a kid? Mom, it's not fair. They're not doing their chores. She's distracted by all the preparations. I wonder how many of us have been faithfully pursuing the urgent and neglecting that which is most important. Right? What is the most important thing that you've been distracted from pursuing in your life? What's the most important thing, think about it, in your life? What's the most important thing? What's the most important thing you've been distracted from doing? I hope you'll take a moment to really settle on that question and think about it. what's the most important thing. Some of you would honestly say, if you're a follower of Jesus, you'd say, you know what? I've been distracted from spending time with Jesus. I haven't put him first. I haven't spent time in the word reading scripture. I haven't aligned my heart with him. I've been distracted from this. Some of you say, I'm busy doing things for my kids, doing things for my kids. I, I, I'm doing stuff for my kids. I, actually, I haven't even enjoyed my kids. Some of you, if you're really honest, would say you become child-centered parents and your whole life revolves around your kids. And what have you neglected? Your marriage. And then when they move out, you find out, oh my gosh, it's just you and I. Here we are. And there's no buffer. You know, kids are a buffer. Are you, hello? And you neglect the very thing because scripture says kids are like arrows meant to be shot out of the bow of the parents. Fly, baby, fly. Get on out of the nest. Go make it on your own. You can do it. That's success, right? Friday, we went up to UT and visited Zach Aroni. And, you know, it was a great visit. Had a good time. Took him out to eat for real food, you know. Not ramen noodles So he's been eating. And it was great. And then on the end of the trip, Renee's like bawling. She's like, I'm like, why are you crying? This is success. He's getting ready to fly out of the nest. This is what we want. We don't, moving in back home is not success. Some of you neglected your relationship with others. Some of you say, I've neglected my physical body. There's so much going on. I don't have time to eat right. I go fast food's convenient. And I, who has time to work out? I mean, I'd like to walk three days a week. I just don't have time. Some of you be more internal. There's an addiction or a habit or recurring sin or something that, you know, you need to deal with. You need to confess. Oh, I don't have time to do 12 steps. I got time for the addiction, but not 12, not, not time for the, the healing. No. Martha's distracted. Verse 41, Jesus answers her. He says, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things. So let me just stop there. Some of you, that might, like everybody has a life verse. This might be someone's life verse in a bad way. You're worried and upset about many things. That's my verse, man. You're freaked out all the time. Oh, my gosh. Diapers, kids, husband, underwear on the ground, got to throw in the closet. Oh, my gosh. Worried and upset about so many things. Jesus said, few things are needed. And then what does he say? This is what Jesus says. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. What's Mary done? Mary's chosen what is better. She made a choice. Martha surrendered to the urgent. Mary chose what was important. So listen, if we're not intentional about this, and that's what I'm trying to get you to think about. Your decisions make you. If you're not intentional about this, I promise you the urgent will crowd out the more important. And it happens all the time. We have a choice. We make choices. Those choices make us. We have to make time for what we choose to have time for. And that's why with the help of God, we'll choose that which is important over the urgent. Amen? So uh, I want to just give you some practical tools on how to do this because I don't always get it right. I often surrender to the urgent, but I'm trying to surrender to the important first. So just three real practical ways that you can take home with you, and you can use these at any time. How do you choose the important? Well, think about your life and then create artificial deadlines. You may say, Pastor, what's an artificial deadline? Well, an artificial deadline is actually an artificial deadline. It's real tricky like that. Uh, it's fake. I'll give an example. When... 
is like just like the most important thing that I do, at least in my mind, not in your mind, but in my mind, the most important time I have is right now. The most important thing I work on is this, the message. Every week, that's what dominates my mind, okay? And so when is my message technically due? It's due for you Sunday at 11 a.m. If it ain't ready by Sunday at 11 a.m., it ain't ever going to be ready. But I create an artificial deadline. So when is next Sunday's message due? It's actually due tomorrow, Monday at noon. That's why Mondays, I really don't want to see you much. I don't want to love you much. I just want you to leave me alone because I'm trying to write a great message for you on Sunday. Can you just leave me alone on Mondays, please? Because I'm trying to work on my message and I'm trying to get it done by noon or 2 o'clock. It's just an artificial deadline. Why would I leave something? So, this is the most important thing I do. I am a preacher. I've met preachers who go, oh, I get sick when I preach. Oh, I, get, I have diarrhea before I preach. I'm like, not me. I'm ready. Come on. As you know, <laughs> I don't mind. Why would I leave something so important up to the last minute? I have a lot of other important things I do, like lead the church, like, like help take care of a school so we can be the best of the best. Come on. All these important things are hanging out there, weighing the balance. If I have all those things weighing out there, I'm never focused on one thing. I'm scattered in too many directions. So my first priority every week is to focus on a message for my church. So we're going to create artificial deadlines, and that frees us up once we're done with that to do other things that are important. The second thing, if you're taking notes, is be ruthlessly selective in your yeses. Be incredibly careful and prayerful about what you say yes to. Today, the barrier to meaningful life is not a lack of a commitment, but it's actually overcommitment. Somebody say amen. amen. Let me say it again. For most people today, the barrier to meaningful life is not that you're not committed, it's that you're overcommitted and you're doing way, 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 way too much. How you been? Busy, 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 overwhelmed. Understand this, busyness does not always equal productivity. Busyness does not always equal significance. In fact, most people, instead of adding to to-do to list, like you have a to-do list, I have a to-do list, right, yeah? You should start a don't-do list. And this is brilliant, and I've been doing this for a week now, and no one's picked up on it. People say, hey, can you do that? And I go... Yeah, let me add that to my uh, to don't do list. And they're like, okay, yeah, thanks for handling it. Yeah, I'm going to put it on my not to do list. Okay, great. And people just go with it because they think you say to do list. I just told them I'm not doing it. I'm going to add it to my not to do list. What? Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to do that. Well, why? Why aren't you going to do that? Because if I do that, I won't have time to do other things. So, I'm going to say no to good opportunities all the time. Why? So I can say yes to the best. No to the good, yes to the best. The best leaders do not do more. They do more of what matters most. The best moms, they don't do more. They do more of what matters most. The best teachers, they don't do more. They invest their energy and time in what matters most. The best and most effective followers of Jesus don't do more and more and more. They do more of what brings glory to God. Amen? You're only one decision away from a different life. So that means we're going to create artificial deadlines. We're going to say yes to the best and no to the good. And then the third thing, if you're taking notes, is we're going to do first what matters most. That's why the first thing I work on every week is this message, because it matters the most to me. Maybe not to you, but it does to me. We're going to do first what matters most. And actually, Mark Twain taught me this. You should read Mark Twain. Mark Twain's brilliant. Love Mark Twain. He said this, if it's your job to eat a frog, it's the best thing to do it first thing in the morning. If it's your job to eat two frogs, it's best to eat the biggest one first. You ever had a big project at work and you're like, man, I don't want to get to it. I don't want to get to it. I don't want to get to it. But if you do it the first thing, right away, Monday morning, create the artificial deadline, you feel so much better, the rest of the week goes much better. Some of you are like, some of you have been doing this workout program for a long time. You get up, okay, I'm going to work out after work. And then what happens? 
5 o'clock, 5.30, 6 o'clock, you get home, I'm too tired to work out. I'll do it tomorrow. You wake up the next day, okay, I'm going to work out after work. Don't work out after work. Work out first thing in the morning. Get up earlier. Eat the frog right now. When you eat the frog right away, well, guess what? You're like, ah, hi, eat the frog. Hello? This works for me. Jesus said it this way, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then everything else will be added to it. The problem with us is we're seeking everything else first and wondering why we don't have a life that matters. Why don't I have a life that matters? That's what people want. People want to know, do I have a life that matters? Am I just taking up air? We seek him first. So I go for a walk every morning, three to four miles, and on that walk I'm praying, and I'm asking God, and I'm reading Scripture, and I'm doing breath prayers. I'm not praying the entire time. I'm doing breath prayers. And I'm like, God, align my heart with your heart. God, use these hands for your work today. God, use these feet to do your work. God, help me to forgive that person. You know that person I'm struggling to forgive. Help me to do that. And I'm just doing breath prayers. And every day I'm aligning myself. And sometimes people are like, well, and then I do a prayer journal. And then I spend five nights a week. It's a priority for me. Lots of times I have meetings, but I'll eat with Renee at 830 because it's a priority for me to eat with my bride five nights a week. And every Friday night is date night. Every Friday night is chips and queso night. Because if I don't date Renee, somebody else will. Look at her. Come on. You don't date your spouse, somebody else will. Rest assured. So those go on first. I'm not going to respond to what everyone else wants me to do until I've first done what God wants me to do. Imagine that. What's on God's to-do list for me? You're only one decision away from changing your life. And I'll give you an example of this because some of you don't believe me. But I want to give you a great example Carl Amby, and I love Carl Amby. I sent this story to my son, Jacob, who's uh, going to be going into medical school. Carl Amby grew up on welfare most of his life. His childhood home in Cleveland, Ohio, he remembers growing up without lights, no water, no electricity. He barely graduated from high school. He took a series of menial jobs. He became good, kind of a shade tree mechanic. And so he became kind of an auto mechanic by default. And then he actually opened up his own auto shop, and it was successful. But his dream was not to be an auto mechanic. His dream was to go from motors to medicine. And he, he writes, I remember having the desire at a young age to become a doctor, but my life circumstances led me to a much different place. And then he says these words. Now, you think about this. From my own experience, it's very difficult to focus on your education when your mind is filled with challenges outside the walls of school food insecurity, safely making it to and from school, affording decent clothing and basic school supplies, or just trying to fit in, took precedent over studying and getting good grades. He does credit his parents. He said his parents taught him the value of always working, never giving up your dreams, no matter how improbable. So at 34 years old in 2006, he enrolled in Ursuline College to get a business degree to help him run his auto shop better. But he had to take a biology course, and the biology course reminded him of his dream to become a doctor. And so he prayed and prayed, and he realized God was calling him to be a doctor. So he went to medical school at the age of 47. He graduated at the age of 47. And now finally, after doing his internship at the age of 51, he's not auto shop owner. He is Dr. Carl Ambley. He's an ER doctor. And I love his parallels he draws between being an auto mechanic and ER doctor. He says, every day is different. And just as with a car, his work in the emergency room has, quote, the potential to go from zero to 60 in seconds. <laughs> now listen to what he says and think about what he says about who you are now and who you'll be five years from now. He wrote, I would hear people say, Carl, it's going to take you nine years to become a doctor. And I would say, well, nine years is going to pass anyway. So I'd rather be a place, be someplace I want to be rather than someplace I could have been. Hello? That's wisdom. You're only one decision away from a totally different life. Now, let me tell you about baby doll Renee. As you all know, Renee and I are quite different. Renee's an introvert. I'm an extrovert. Renee gets her energy from being alone, quiet. I get my energy from right now, from being around you all. 
Renee's idea of a good time at our house is her on the couch with a book, a candle lit, soft music playing in the background, and I am nowhere to be found. <laughs> Along with the dog. We're out. We're gone. That's her idea of a good time. My idea of a good time is 25 of you come over this evening and we have a party. You know, we have, I grill some fajitas and we have a party with chips and queso and that'd be great. So this, that's really my idea of a good time. People in my living room. I, I love being around people. I like people. Renee, not so much. Okay. She doesn't love you as much as I do. That's just the reality. Okay. <laughs> So this has created a lot of tension between us in our 28 years of marriage. This has created tension because there are times that my job calls for me to be social and her job is like she doesn't want to be social. So anyway, it's, there's a lot of tension. So when people come over, what is she worried about? She's Martha. How's the house look? Are the 45 pillows lined up? Does the potpourri match the shower curtain? She's all about that. I'm like, relax, I don't care. So for instance, we're at Zach's apartment. He's in a five bedroom apartment in a high rise called the Tory at Austin. He loves it, it's great, it's very urban. I, I don't know, it's not for me. He's got five roommates, four of them, um, kids he knows from veterans, uh, other boys, and then one female, uh, so there's four guys and one female, five roommates. And I said, Zach, how are you getting along with your roommates? Because they have a common space and they each have their own little room with their own private bathroom. Way better than I had, okay? Anyway, how do you get along with your roommates? Dad's going great, except for the girl. <laughs> Why is that, son? Well, Dad, her idea of a clean apartment and our idea of a clean apartment Two different things. I said, well, okay. Uh, tell me more. Well, Dad, she wants to start charging all four of us guys to clean up after us guys. We think it's clean. According to us guys, it's totally clean. Four against one. She's wrong, Dad. It's totally clean. I'm like, son, she's probably right. You should probably start paying her. And so then I said, so how's classes? Boring. Well, how's it? Well, like, what's the best thing about your class, son? Look for the good here. Look for the good. This is what he says. Total Sean Spicoli, if you know who Spicoli is. Okay. Okay. What's the best thing about classes, son? When they're over. <laughs> <laughs> so I said to him, I said, look, this will never go away. When you get married, Zach, your wife's idea of clean and your idea of clean will be two different things. Trust me. So over the years, Renee and I always had this attention. Tension, tension. I want to host 30 people. Uh, and so people come over. Renee goes into panic mode. We fight. And you don't think that Renee could fight. She's small, but she wins, okay? She wins all the time. It's like hummingbird versus gorilla. You'd have your money on me, but she's going to win every time, okay? That's what happens. So we can fight, and we fight. I know you don't think pastor and his wife would ever fight, but we fight. Sometimes we fight. I'm not saying it gets ugly. I'm just saying... She wins. Anyhow, <laughs> so, so I'll never forget the day Renee comes in one day and she says, okay, okay, because I was wanting to have people over. She goes, what if we just choose people over perfection? And I'm thinking, this is going to preach. What do you mean? She says, what if we just choose people? Like when people come over, we just choose them, administer them, love them, and have relations with them, and just over perfection over how the house works. In other words, the house doesn't just have to be right. We can just kind of be ourselves, and if they don't like us, then that's okay. We're just going to be ourselves, and we're going to choose relationship over image. We're going to choose people over perfection. If they're Cheerios that are on the ground or cobwebs, deal with it. Sorry, folks. And I was like, yeah, that makes total sense. Come on over. So now I'm going to tell you that, look, you can come on over. Everything may not be just right, but you can come on over. You can get refrigerator rights. That's more important over the urgent. Are you with me? Hello? All right. And I'll tell you about another moment that changed my ministry, and it really did change my ministry. When Zach was five years old, five years old, I was focused on doing church work, and lots of times I would bring church work home. I don't bring church work home anymore. I really don't. I mean, if you call me or you have a need or if someone goes to the hospital, so I, yeah, I'll deal with it then. But in terms of working on sermons, I used to work on sermons all the time. I do it only at the office now or only on walks 
because of what happened when Zach was five. When Zach was five, I said to him, I came home for a little dinner, and I said, Zach, when you get home, you'll be in bed, but I'm going to pray for you, and I'll give you a kiss goodnight, but I got to go to a church meeting. And he looked at me. He wasn't hateful. He was totally sweet. He was totally innocent. And I told him, I'll be home tonight. And he said, Dad, this isn't your home. Your home is the church. And I was like, oh, that, that was like, ah, something's got to change. Something's got to change. So the next day I called my mentor and I said, something's got to change. And so I changed my life about that. I changed my approach to work because you're only one decision away from, from a totally different life. And I didn't want just for my son to grow up not knowing who I was, right? I wanted him to know who I was. I wanted to be in his life. So now when I go home, I don't do sermon work. Aren't you glad? Can you imagine how long they would be if I did? Like, please stop. It's enough. <laughs> okay, that's just me. Anyhow, do you like who you are right now? Because chances are, unless you change your daily habits, and I mean daily, start putting on sunscreen, five years from now, you're just going to be more exaggerated. If you don't start choosing the important over the urgent, you're going to let the tyranny of the urgency run your life. Artificial deadlines. Be selective, be prayerful and careful about what you say yes to. Examine your daily habits. Line up with God every day, every day. Kingdom of God, get your calendar right because you have time for what you make time for. Set up your life so fires don't happen. And then you don't have to put out the fire. Come on, that was a little summary right there. A little summation, we're done. Aren't you excited? I know she is. All right, let's pray. Let's pray. God of grace, we give thanks for this amazing lesson that comes to us from Martha and Mary. We pray, Lord, that we would choose the important over the urgent, and that by doing so, there wouldn't be so many urgent things. Help us, God, to be selective about what we say yes to, to be prayerful, to seek first your kingdom and align everything to that. Help us to be intentional and consistent about how we live our lives. And remember, if we don't like the way our lives go, we're only one decision away from changing it. And we can change it right now. So, Lord, if we've never committed to you, we want to take this opportunity to make a commitment right now to you. We commit our hearts, our lives, our time, our agendas, everything, Lord. We seek first your kingdom, and we do that right now. And we make a stand, we draw a line in the sand today, and we're going to make the decisions that will change the rest of our life. And you know what? Nine years is going to pass. And who do we want to be nine years from now? Do we want to be an auto shop mechanic or a doctor? The decisions we make today will change all that, can, can affect all that. Help us to know that today, Lord, and to make the right choices. We give thanks that Jesus made choices, that he had choices, and he chose the cross out of love for each of us. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, and he prayed, and he chose what was most important, and that was his Father's will. And he gave up his life so that we might have life. And he paid the price so we might be free of the debt. So we give thanks for Jesus, and we pray the prayer he taught us as we say now together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debt, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is kingdom, and power, and the glory forever. Amen. Before we have this last closing song, I want to invite Patty and Nacho to come on forward. Come on down. Uh, if you... Uh, Oh, you can get on the stage if you want, Nacho. Go ahead, man. That's cool. <laughs> we'll give you a microphone if you want. No? <laughs> uh, if you don't know Patty yet, you should get to know her for a couple reasons. One, she's an amazing soul, an amazing woman. And two, she could bake a fence post and you'd eat it and say it's delicious. This woman can bake. You've probably eaten some of her food. The What do you make today? Flautas? Flautas. So if you haven't had a flout, she makes real flautas, not those chintzy kind you get. Mix it with the real stuff. So get to know her and her grandson, Nacho. Uh, just two questions. Do you love Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior? If so, say yes. yes. And will you be faithful to this family of faith with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service? 
And will you love them and welcome them as brothers and sisters in Christ? Say, we will. We will. You heard it right here. Welcome to the family. Glad to have you. All right, Nacho. Congratulations. All right. Let's stand and sing this last song. Let us worship our King. Friends, go home, put on some sunscreen. Trust me, we need it. And uh, do it every day. Be consistently, become who you want to become. Become who God has called you to be every day. It's consistency. It beats intensity. Become who God called you to become. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Make sure we get a picture.